All righty, church. Well, hey, we're in week three of our holiday series called Generous God, For God So Loved the World That He Gave. And this whole series is about looking at the same way that God has been generous to us. We see the same ways that the characters in the Bible story were also generous. Like, you know, God has given himself to us in Jesus being our Savior. And we see Mary gave herself that the Savior could come into the world. And we know that um, God has generously given us grace. And we see that Joseph generously gave grace to Mary in their complicated situation. And we know that God has given us hope. And next week we're going to look at how the shepherds generously gave us hope when they declared the birth of our Savior. And the God has given us treasures and the wise men uh, generously gave their treasures to the Lord. And so we're going to talk about the wise men today. We're entitling today's message, Growing in Generosity. So today we're going to be talking about what the Bible has to say about money, our relationship with money, our responsibility with money, doing money God's way. And I have to be honest with you, like when I was a younger pastor, I was a little more afraid to talk about this topic. I was really afraid of, oh, what if it's the first time someone's coming to our church and, you know, the first sermon they're hearing me preach is about money. But I'm, I'm, I've matured through that, that I'm not afraid anymore because I see that God has so many keys and truths in his word that are simply just trying to help us live. And if there's something that I could ever say to help somebody live more for God, why would I ever withhold that? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And when we're talking about money, there are three things. There's, there's the have-tos, there's the want-tos, and there's the called-tos. How many of you know there's the have to? We have to have money coming in because we have to spend money to live, right? We all have to have money. And then there's the want to. We all want to be saving money. And then we sometimes forget that we're also called to give. And that's really the key in uh, being a generous towards God is in our giving. And um, I want to introduce John, who's up on the platform with me today. John and his wife, Carol, um, have been a part of our church now for several years, coming from a Catholic background, and uh, God uh, led them to uh, Cornerstone Chapel. And they, man, they just jumped right in, um, just being uh, part of Sunday mornings and small groups and dream teams. And especially over the last two years where you and Carol were able to um, go through Cornerstone Bible School and complete that. And since you are in the world of money and your career revolves around that, I invited John to uh, just team teach with me today. So, John? Hey, but thanks, Pastor Mark. I, I, it's an overused statement, but it, it is such a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today and to be able to speak with our church. Uh, Again, my name is John Munka. I am a financial consultant. I, uh, I'm a registered investment advisor. I manage primarily retirement portfolios. Uh, I've been doing this for about 35 years. Uh, so I think that this was an important uh, talk today because, you know, every aspect of our lives, we can look to the Bible as our guide for what God wants us yeah, to do, yeah. right? And so sometimes it feels like our lives revolve around money, though, right? We, you know, making it and spending it. And it can be a difficult um, balance, you know. And so, you know, when we're, we're, as a result, we're called to properly steward what God's given us and foster a healthy relationship with that money. You know, we live in a culture that tells us that having more is better, right? Mm. The tendency of our flesh is to want a bigger house, a nicer car, the newest phone, another vacation, and another vacation, and more and more and more, Right? And if we're trying to find happiness in money, we're never going to be satisfied. Ecclesiastes 5.10 tells us this. Whoever knows money, whoever loves money, never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. I remember when I started my career many, many years ago uh, in downtown Cleveland. We're, on the, we're in a, we're, what's called a wire house. I was with Shearson Lehman Hutton. It's like a Merrill Lynch, Dean Witter, Payne Weber. And... We were on the 27th floor of a downtown building in Cleveland. It's a beautiful office. And when I was new there, I was looking at, like, all the other advisors that were there and the corner offices. Wow, the corner offices. The people that sat in the corner offices, man, they had 
it all. They had big businesses and they had big money and they were, we were just in awe of them. And they had the nice cars and the big home, maybe two, maybe three, right? And I, I used to think, you know, they walk around with a pen in their pocket that's worth more than my weekly budget for food. <laughs> and I was always wanting to just know what made them tick and what they were about. And so as I got to know them, it was a strange situation that, that after a while I thought, these people are not that happy. People that seem to have everything have so little. And I couldn't define it, and I wasn't really along, far enough along in my spiritual journey, but there was a spirit. When I came into their office, there was a feeling that I just didn't like. And I believe today that it was, the, it was Satan, it was the devil. It, the devil had a hold of them. Now, not necessarily that it had a hold of them, they're bad people, but he had a hold of them, mm. and he had them convinced that their entire worth mm. was in their money was in their homes, was in their status and their prestige. That that was their identity. Nothing to do with God, just themselves and their money. And I think that seemed for me a big learning lesson that what we, what we looked at, and as I got to know these people, I thought, I don't want to be like these people. This is not what I thought it was going to be like. Right. So, you know, for me today, um, this is a journey into my relationship with money. Mm. And I want to you know, say that until I had that firmly established, um, that relationship, I, I found that there was peace and blessing in giving right, as long right. as that was established. Yeah. You know, this is the, really a, a good time to be talking about this because the Bible talks about God caring about every detail of our life. You know, he cares about our salvation. He cares about our families. And he cares about this area of our life right now. And I don't know if you've noticed, but money is a really stressful thing, can't right? Um, especially right now when uh, you can look at the, the economy is not doing that great. It seems like cost all around, grocery costs, utility costs, they're all going up. Then you have holiday stress where you know, we want to buy gifts and all these things coming up. But man, there's good news. There's good news in God's word that um, we can experience his peace um, in our finances. And that leads us to the big idea today. You're going to see it up on the screens, but the big idea is this. Aligning my financial life to Scripture brings peace and blessing. Isn't that true? Aligning my financial life, how I do money. If, when, when I align that to Scripture, you know, money can still be stressful, but I can experience God's peace and blessing through that all. Now, I know... Um, there's different groups of people here today, and there's probably some that, that know what the Bible says, and they're practicing that, and they're experiencing God's peace. And um, there might be people that have known it or heard it in the past, but perhaps um, you've, uh, you're not practicing it for various situations, like uh, maybe you're in a transition in life or a job change or something like that. And um, uh, today's a good reminder to get back to aligning our life. Some people, maybe they're new in the faith or they didn't grow up in the church and, and they just don't know. And today is just like hearing it for the first time, like, wow, you know, like I can experience God's peace and blessing in this area of my life as well. Which leads me to this box that is sitting up here on the table today. Church, this is a box of saran wrap. Come on, how many of you have ever used saran wrap? Come on. Guys, raise your hand too. Come on, guys, girls, raise your hand at me if you've ever wrestled with a box of saran wrap, right? Cling wrap, plastic wrap, whatever you want to call it. But I have this box of saran wrap here with me today because I was talking with a friend recently who uh, we got on the topic of a box of saran wrap, and I'm like, you know what? Finances are like a box of saran wrap. You know why? I don't know about you, but when you open this thing, have you ever had your saran wrap like you're not, like, where do I start peeling? Like, I don't know where the end is, you know, and you're trying to find it. Oh, and then you finally find it, and you start to rip it out, and the roll wants to come out like that, and, and then you're like, oh, man, then I'm, then I'm trying to rip it, and you're like, oh, man, it's just a mess. Now, I know I'm exaggerating, okay, but I'm trying to drive a point home to say this, is that, is that our finances are like a box of saran wrap. You know why? Because the Bible gives us these little tidbits 
these little keys, these little helps to help our financial life not be so stressful, to have more of God's peace and blessing. And how many of you knew on the side of every box of saran wrap, there are these little instructions. Now raise your hand if you do, if you do, you notice this. Has anyone ever noticed the directions? Very, very, very few of you have ever noticed on the box of every saran wrap, and we have a picture of it here, this says, push in the tab to lock the roll in right? So there's this little tab, and you're going to see it on the screen. When you press in the little tab, look at this, and you press it in, whoa, it's going to make my saran wrap experience way better, okay? Because now when I pull that saran wrap, those tabs just lock it into place, (laughs) and my cling wrap experience can be so much better. Come on, (laughs) church, right? So... Anyways, what we're going to do today is we just want to show our church family um, where in the Bible are these little things that would help us um, to have more of God's peace. So we're going to look at the story of the wise men today. I want to give you three very practical applications on how we can grow in generosity. So let's jump in here today. Matthew 2 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi, or wise men, from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? Notice how they referred to Jesus as King of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now listen to this. When King Herod, two kings now, when King Herod heard this, oh man, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem was with him. Church, the first point I want to give to you today in how we can grow in generosity is give despite resistance. Give despite the resistance. Let me tell you how we got this point out of this passage. So we have two kings. We have King Herod and we have King Jesus. Baby Jesus was was king of kings. So what happens is the wise men wanted to come worship uh, the new king on the block, King Jesus. They wanted to come worship him. And they asked King Herod how they could find King Jesus. And man, I'm telling you, when King Herod heard, watch this that he used to be the main guy, that everyone worshipped him, and now there's a new king on the block, that attention was going to start going to King Jesus instead of King Herod, that was a threat to him. He was threatened by that, and he was ticked, and he was disturbed, and he later on was going to try to do anything to stop that. He was going to try to throw roadblock after roadblock in their way to stop the wise men from, watch this, giving to the new king, Jesus, okay? King Herod in Scripture represents what we call a biblical typology. A biblical typology is when we use somebody in Scripture to illustrate somebody else in Scripture. Like, let me give you an example. In Genesis 22, God called Abraham to take his son Isaac, his one and only son, up to the mountain and sacrifice him on an altar, Okay, that is a biblical typology in the New Testament when God the Father gave his one and only son to be sacrificed on a cross for our sins. See the similarities? Well, in Scripture we see here that King Herod is a biblical typology but not of a good person. King Herod is a biblical typology of Satan. You know why? Because King Herod is very threatened by Jesus. He doesn't want any attention any of of, of the generosity, any of the gifts, any of the worship to go to Jesus. So he's going to try to do anything to resist the wise men giving to Jesus. And what he does is he tricks them. He tries to be deceptive and he goes, oh, you're looking for Jesus? So was I. Hey, when you find him, let me know so I can go and worship him. That was a big lie because we know that King Herod didn't want to do anything else but kill Jesus. In fact, later on, he killed Uh, all the boys under age two because he wanted to kill Jesus. Church, who does that sound like? It sounds like Satan to me. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? That's exactly what King Herod was trying to do. So we see in Scripture the same way that King Herod was trying to resist the wise men from giving, but they gave anyway. They did it anyway. So are we 
when Satan does not want us to give. Why would Satan not want us to give? Because Satan knows that when we give to God, he knows we're going to experience peace, we're going to experience joy, we're going to experience blessing in our life, and he does not want that. So when we start to make an effort to start to give, Satan is going to come in like a flood to be a roadblock to resist that. Is that making sense? So John and I said, well, what are some of the resistances that we face today? Well, the first one is this. The, it, it's just uh, misunderstanding. Many times Christians have a misunderstanding of giving. We're like this. Man, the economy's bad. I'm, I, you know, it, 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 costs are rising. Why in the world would I give my hard-earned money to God or to the church? Why would I do that? Okay. Well, we, we often misunderstand that, that God is, is the owner of everything. I am simply a steward. Right, church? Like everything that I have really belongs to God, and he's called me to manage it and steward it, not to be the owner of it. See, God is never trying to take from us. He's not trying to get something from us. He's trying to get something to us. He's trying to get peace to us and blessing to us and provision. And he doesn't need anything that we could ever give him. He simply wants our heart. In this verse in Hosea 4, 6 says this, my people are destroyed. Or what the Bible is saying is oftentimes my people simply misunderstand because they have not learned, watch this, the simple tabs that can help us experience God's joy and blessing. The second one is this. Many times there's a resistance because of a bad experience. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would say in a room this size and those joining online, I would say that there's probably a handful of people that have one time or another given to a charitable organization or a church, tried to be helpful, tried to be generous, and it ended up not a good experience, right? You know, maybe the person we thought was uh, integral and they ended up not being integral. Maybe they looked like they had character and they didn't have character. Maybe they weren't transparent. Maybe they just always come across like acting like trying to want, 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 take, 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 give, 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 always gimme, 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 more, more, more. And you're like, man, that just puts a sour taste in my mouth. And because I've had bad experiences in the past, Satan will use that as a current or future resistance to put in your way to say, you know what? I tried that before and I got burned. And I'm never going to do that again. I worked too hard for this money. I am not going to do that. You know, sometimes people believe because, and rightly so, church, because of pastors or preachers or tele-evangelists, you know, doing what they've done in the past. Some people think, well, the church, all they want is my money. And I could see how people could say that. And I just want to say, um, you know, um, we need to get to a place where despite any bad experiences, okay, we still do the right thing. Just because we've had a bad experience does not mean we stop doing the right thing. Doesn't mean we have to go back and trust the people that have no integrity or no character. No. If they're not going to be integral, don't give there. Give somewhere else where, they're, where they have transparency and character and integrity. Amen? But still do the right thing. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3, brothers and sisters, we can't allow ourselves to get tired of doing what is right. I think the third resistance, misunderstand, bad experiences, I, John, I think this is the biggest, is fear. I think Satan, who is the author of fear, wants to put so much fear in our life when it comes to giving. Thinking this, I'm starting to feel like, I, you know, I really need to do this. And he'll be right there to put fear in our life. Say, oh, if you do that, you're not going to have enough. You're not going to have enough for groceries. You're not going to have enough for rent to pay, you know, pay your bills. You're not going to have enough. Putting that fear, always bringing up the bad things about the economy, you know, perhaps you are in a transition of life or a season of life of change or, or maybe you're a single parent or maybe you're married to someone who doesn't know the Lord and they just, you know, forbid you to do that or whatever situation you're in, there's so much fear the enemy could put on us. But church, can I just say, God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind to trust him, to know that no matter what financial difficulty I might be in, it never exempts me from not trusting the Lord, okay? 
And so the Bible says, I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be a blessing. Yeah, those are great points. And, you know, Pastor Mike made a really good point last week when he was talking about the details in the Bible. And he was saying, you know, there just aren't enough pages to be printed to give us all the details and all the intricacies we need to know everything about every story. And I think the wise men is a great example of that, right? We don't really know who they were. Right. We don't know where they came from. We don't really know how far they traveled. But theologians have studied this and studied the wording of the Bible, and some of the best guesses are that they feel that they may have come somewhere uh, from Babylon, uh, which is about 1,600 miles from Jerusalem. So they estimate that it probably took four to, say, five months to make this journey. So they come on this journey. It's not like they're going to spend a long weekend and then head back, yeah. right? So in the time of Herod, you know, the type of Satan, isn't it just like Satan to say, oh, they're a little tired now, they're a little weary, and they know what that journey was like. You guys don't want to take another route. Don't go the other way. Don't you remember all the, all the, 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 the livestock that died on the trip over? Don't you remember when those, those people stole some of your food at night and while you were sleeping? Don't you remember all the, ch the, the challenges you had? Now you're not only going to go through a new path, it's longer and further. What do you want to do that for? Hmm. Take the easy way back. You know that route. You've done, done it before. It's good. It's comfortable. But they didn't do that, did they? Right. They did the right thing. They gave despite the resistance. Despite the resistance. So when does Satan show up for us? You don't need to give. Give. God doesn't need money. But it sounds like that's all he wants is your money, right? He just wants your money. You don't need to give. And what you're going to give, that's not going to make any difference anyway. Don't give. By the way, what about that vacation we're saving for? It's going to take a lot longer if you start giving. Hmm. Come on. Look, there's the remote. There's the TV. Let's turn it on. Let's watch some Netflix, right? That's Satan. And so what we have to say is, what's our decision going to be at this point? What's our answer going to be to Satan? Yeah. Amen. So it's all about trust. Yep. I mean, we have to recognize that whenever there's a resistance that we feel to giving, it could be, probably is, Satan behind it, trying to get us to resist. Why? He doesn't want us to do it because he doesn't want us to experience the joy, peace, and blessing that is in it when we do give. Let's go on to the is, second one. Well, it's so about trust, though. I, I love that. And, you know, Proverbs 3 uh, talks about this. Uh, in verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Right. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This for us, for Carol and me, was a turning point in our relationship with money. Um, you know, the same way we put our trust in the Lord for many things. We, we put things at their, his feet. It's like, I, you know, I can't deal with this, Lord. I, I need your help. Right. I need your guidance today. I need your wisdom today. I need some energy today. I need, just talk to me, speak to me, right? Oh, my money too? No, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. My money, uh, no. I, it's a little less comfortable. I think it's just kind of an uncomfortable thing to trust in the Lord with your money too because that is such a personal thing that's so concrete. It's the, it's the physical representation of our labors here on earth, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's very, very difficult to have that trust. And what we have to do is look at the Bible and say, this is what it says. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. When we tied this truth to our finances, it changed everything for us. Mm. It did. So first way to grow in generosity is give despite the resistances. Number two, let's go back to our text in Matthew 2. It says, after they, the wise men, had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose ahead of them and until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and did what? They worshipped him. Number two way we can grow in generosity is give despite the resistance, but number two is give as an act of worship. See our giving as a spiritual act of worship. What in the world does, how could that even be? Like, what does money have to do with worship, okay? Because so many times we think of money as, that's just a financial transaction, that's just an economic transaction. But when we give to God, and it, and it is when we give to other things, it is just economic. But when we give to God, 
it changes and becomes a spiritual act of worship. Just like prayer is a very holy and, 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 and worshipful thing, um, reading the Bible, singing, all those things that we think are spiritual, wor- uh, giving is, an, is another way that we worship God. Worship, the definition, is expressing love for someone or something. Because many times when we think of worship, we think of it only in the context of God. Like, well, worship is when I, when I express love to God. No, back up. Worship is when I express my love to anything or anybody. Because I could, I could worship mankind. I could worship uh, a, a material possession. But worship in the context of God is when I'm expressing my love for God, that what I'm doing is I'm saying, God, you're the one that has my heart. I'm, I'm, I read the word, I come to church, I worship, I sing because you have my heart. Well, the same with giving. When we give as a spiritual act of worship, we're saying, God, this is my act of worship to you that you're the one that has my heart. And you know what? There's always going to be things that are competing for our heart. How many of you have found that out, right? There's always things tugging at our heart, competing for our heart. But God needs to be the one that's number one in every area of our life. Amen? Amen. And oftentimes, we see this all throughout Scripture, oftentimes we see that Jesus tests us with money. Why? Because um, God is allowing us to be tested with money to see where he ranks in our life. Does he really rank number one? Is he really number one in our heart? Because there's this thing, as John was saying, with money, money is so connected with our soul. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now watch this part. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. See how money is tied to our soul. And when we see our giving as a spiritual act of worship, we're saying, my soul, God has my heart. God has it. And look at this one in Matthew 6 where it says, For where your treasure is... There your heart will also be. So church, yes, we have to give despite the resistance, but we also have to see giving is not just an economical thing. When we give to God, we are worshiping God through our giving. Yeah, that word treasure, Pastor Mark, is, uh, is very interesting in, this, in Matthew. Uh, you know, I, I always thought of that as an invitation to define treasure as something other than money. Treasure the verb. What is it that you treasure, right? What, that which you treasure but what if, what if, he, if he's asking, maybe he's saying, define what your relationship with money is. Treasure the noun, right? Where your treasure is, where your money is, where you see, where you feel, where that, where that is, where your heart is with that, that also may speak to you where you are. Uh, when I say the word treasure, what comes to mind? I, I think of a treasure chest. You think of a treasure chest, a treasure chest like a pirate's treasure chest. Yeah. It opens up and there's all these gold yeah, and jewels right. and everything in it, right? And so it's this physical manifestation of wealth. It's, it's what we've, we've amassed. I, uh, I remember when my kids were young, uh, the movie Aladdin came out. And Aladdin had a little monkey named Abu. And Abu was with him all the time. And so they found themselves in the place called the Cave of Wonders, right? And the Cave of Wonders was, think of this entire room filled with gold and coins and jewels and everything all the way to the ceiling and it's just hanging and draping from everywhere and when abu first casts his eyes on this and he sees this his eyes get really big and then they just start they, they turn into gold coins and they start to melt away mm. and abu starts to walk to, towards him kind of like frankenstein down a hallway just totally mesmerized by this does this in some way describe our relationship to our treasure does the thought of winning the lottery make your hands a little sweaty? Does it, if you were to win the lottery, does it make you think, boy, that would solve a lot of my problems, mm. right? A lot of my issues. Or, you know, is it, is it security? Does it value, uh, does it place value um, in, in, in an insecure world? Does it, you know, create security that is otherwise an insecurity for us? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. As Pastor Mark was saying, there's, there's a certain amount of money that we need right. to live. We right. need that security and that safety. Mm-hmm. But this is where this is an individual question you have to ask yourself and say, but it's not black and white. And there's this great big gray area in between. And you have to say, 
At what point does that security begin to take this, the peace and security mm. that God is supposed to give me? Mm. And so that's where we have to reflect and decide, what does my money mean to me? And for me, because I can only speak for us, monetary giving starts right there with our relationship with money. When we define that relationship with our money, monetary giving, giving becomes so much easier and so much freer. So true, yeah. so true. So growing in generosity, give despite the resistance. Give as a spiritual act of worship. Let's go to the last one here. In our text, in Matthew 2, it says, Then they, the wise men, opened their treasures and presented him with what? Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The third point is this. How can we grow in generosity? Give three-dimensionally. Give three-dimensionally. Just like the wise men gave Jesus three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which all had a different purpose to them, um, in the same way, we can give three-dimensionally. And those three dimensions of giving to Jesus is what's called first fruits or tithes, and then second is offerings, and third is simply aid, just helping. Um, so let's break these three down. What is first fruits? Does that mean I you know, give my apples and bananas and oranges? What, what is this? That's kind of a weird term. Maybe, maybe you've never heard first fruits. What does that even mean? Well, it's a Bible term. Uh, you might have heard it as, as a tithe called tithe. But uh, first fruits is given to God through your local church family. So you give it to God, but you give it to the church. And what first fruits tithe is, is that, just that first. It's that first part of your earnings you give to God. You give it before anything else. That's why it's called first fruits. You don't give it last. You give it first to God. And it's a certain percentage of what God has given us. We give that back to God. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the what? First fruits of all your crops. That word first fruits, again, church, is just that first part of what God has given you. You give that back to God. Or sometimes it's called a tithe. Deuteronomy 14, it says, the purpose of tithing is to what? Teach you always to put God first in your lives. And I love this, this verse because we would say, if God doesn't need anything, you know, why on earth would I ever give first fruits or tithe to God? Like, why would I do that if he doesn't need it? Well, the Bible clearly shows right here that it's not about God needing it, but it's a way that I, when I'm giving God my, my first part back to him, just like the wise men gave that first gift of gold to Jesus, gold represents royalty. It represents king. When I give my first part to God, what I'm saying is, God, you're the king of my heart. You're the king of my life. I'm putting you first, and I'm honoring you with my wealth. We, we always want to put God first in every area of our, our life. Um, in our church, we kick off the first part of the year doing a prayer and fast. Uh, we kick off the first part of our week by coming to church and honoring God that way. We kick off the first part of our day by spending time with God and reading our Bible and praying. And, and we do it this way, too, is by honoring God with that first um, and, and, you know, when it comes to, to, to the first, remember when I said there's the have to, we, we have to have money because we need to spend it, and then we, we want to save, and then we're called to give? Many times, we actually practice it in that order. We spend, and then maybe we'll save, and maybe we'll give, but the problem is, with that is that it's backwards. Actually, it should be flipped around where the first thing we do is we give our first part. We give first. Then we put a little aside to save, and then we live on the rest. See, when we flop it around and we spend first and maybe save and maybe give, what we're doing is we're giving God our leftovers. But when we give to God first and save, then we're living off or we're spending what's left, and God takes that and makes it work in his miraculous ways. So, so first fruits is like we know the who, when, where, why. We know who born again believers, we are called to give first fruits. When? First, before anything else. Where? We give to God through the church. Why? Because we want to honor God. Here's the, no pun intended, million dollar question. Okay? Here's the question that many people ask. Okay, so what does this look like? Like, how much is this? Okay, like, how much is this? Well, 
New Testament believers, look at this, it's on the screen for you. New Testament believers are not bound by any law to tithe 10%. But we are expected to follow biblical principles to put God first and be generous. Now, some of you might be looking at that and say, Mark, is that a typo? Is that a, did you make a mistake here? Because, you know, I thought we were required to give 10. Actually, no. New Testament believers are not required, are not bound by any law anywhere in Scripture to give a 10% tithe. But we are taught and we are expected to uh, follow biblical principles of putting God first and to be generous. So it's not a have to, but it's a want to. In fact, there's principles throughout all of Scripture that we as New Testament believers follow, and this one on giving, actually putting God first in our giving, that showed up 2,500 years before the law of giving was ever put in place. So here's, here's what we could say. Listen to this. We're not required to give 10%. However, we're not required to give only 10%. Did you hear what I just said? Let me, let, me, let me say it this way. New Testament believers are not required to give 10%. You can give 1%, 2%, 3 okay, and we're going to show a scripture on that. However, New Testament believers are not required to give only 10%. You might want to give 15 you might want to give 12 you might want to give 20 See, there's no law in Scripture for New Testament believers to say, you are required to do this. We're not under the law, church. We're under a new covenant. So let's look at where the Bible talks about this. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6-7, it says this, Remember this, the Apostle Paul says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So that's the promise in Scripture that how we sow is how we will reap, okay? And we see that in everything, in our money giving and how we give grace and forgiveness, all the ways. Whatever you plant, that's what you're going to get, okay? That's a promise. But then verse 7, following the promise is the actual practical application. It says, now, here's how much you give. The Bible's very clear. It says, each of you. So that means each New Testament believer each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. A preacher doesn't tell you that. A church doesn't tell you that. A denomination doesn't tell you that. You decide that. The Bible says you're a New Testament believer under the covenant, new covenant. You decide in your heart what to give to God. Then it goes on to say, and it should be something that, you know, when God shows you, it's not given reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So church, how does this work? We have to see that God has, well, we, we, we have to have money coming in to spend. We, 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 we want and hope to save, but God, church, we're all called to give. We're all called to be generous. But the Bible's saying you decide what that looks like for you. And don't ever feel like pressured by, by a preacher or by somebody on TV saying, well, if you send this, I'll... Don't get, don't get pressured. It's not about pressuring or all that stuff that weighs you down. Doesn't that, that stinks, doesn't it? It just doesn't feel good. The Bible says, you know what? Each believer has the Holy Spirit in their heart. You pray and you ask God what generosity looks like in your life, in this season of your life. Amen. Amen. And so when it comes to the first fruit or tithe, I know many people that, that they, they, they give under 10%. That's their first fruit offering to God. That's their tithe. I know many people. And I know many people that give 10%. Uh, I know a lot of people. That, that's just how they were brought up. And, uh, you know, that's what they give. And I know a lot of people that they give more than that because they understand this principle is that, you know, it, 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 the principle is for us to decide what generosity looks like. In fact, I know people that in sales. I have friends that are in sales. And I know just recently someone came up to me and they said, you know what, um, I, I told somebody close to me that, 
um, we started talking about what we're going to tithe, and it was over 10%. And that person challenged them, like, say, why are you giving over 10%? And they're saying, listen, I'm in, I'm in sales. There's a deal I'm trying to close, and I'm trying to give generously. So when I close this deal, God blesses me with a generous deal. And that's just, that was their mindset to say, when, I'm, when I sow sparingly, I can expect sparingly reaping. When I sow generously, I can expect to reap generously. So, so church, that's where we need to be. And I think this is something that we as parents should be teaching our kids. Um, this first fruit, this tithe is so important that as our kids are getting older and they're getting babysitting jobs and mowing the grass jobs, parents, this should be one of the first things we're teaching our kids. The world is not getting any easier out there, is it? Can you, did you ever think as a parent, man, it's going to be pretty tough for my kids. Man, show them right off the bat how they can have financial peace and joy in their life by putting God first. Come on, church. It works. What helps me with that a lot, Pastor Mark, is, uh, is a passage from Deuteronomy 8. It says, uh, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to, to produce wealth. It is he that gives you the ability to produce wealth. This is a gift. What do you say after service today? We go down to the square and we ask some, some people, who's responsible for producing your wealth? What was I going to say five years ago? Me, mm -hmm. right? I get up in the morning, I go to work, I produce the wealth, I do this, I do that. It's all me. Deuteronomy tells us, no, this is a gift from God. Right. This is a gift from God. This is God's gift to us. So we, in turn, owe him part of that gift. There's an economic term called the marginal propensity to produce. By the way, this is the point if my wife were up with us, she'd say, if there's a polite way you can get out of this conversation, now's the time to do it. <laughs> so, but I promise we're not going to get into too deep, deep into economics, but translated, it really just means um, is, is making an extra dollar worth the time and effort to make it. And the answer to that question is going to be different for every single one of us, right? We're all going to be different. Some of us are going to say, yeah, I'd, I'd make the extra dollar for that. I would do this. I would do that. Others would say, nah, I'm just too tired. Or no, it doesn't mean that much to me. Or, you know, generating another dollar doesn't really generate another dollar of satisfaction to me. So I'm in a good place. But we're all different. So when it comes to tithing, I think this was a way the Old Testament had to address what we owe God for the gift of being able to produce more money, the marginal propensity to produce. And so this was a kind of a steadfast rule for them. So everyone's going to be different. It's not like it's something we would want to compare or, again, boy, I don't think my contribution is going to be enough or this is going to be plenty for the church. It's, it's what you're being told, what your heart is telling you through the Bible. So I really think we have to remember that it's the Bible that tells us that the Lord gives us this ability. We don't do this on our own. That's this right. is a gift from God. Right, right. Yeah. You know, I, I remember a little tyke going to church with my parents, and I, I'll never forget this image is just in my mind. I, every week I can, I can just remember my mom. My mom's the one that wrote the checks, and I can just remember her just writing that check and, and just doing that. And as a parent, just doing that so influenced my life that for I've been giving first fruit uh, tied to, to God now for 44 years. I know it started when I was 12 years old when I had this little side job. And, and I just know that, you know, um, all these years that, you know, Deb and I have been in certain situations where we can look back and say, you know what, we're in a tough spot right now, or we're facing this humongous expense, or whatever's going on, or where's this money going to come from? And we just look at each other with peace and say, you know what, we've given our first part back to God, we don't have anything to worry about. And there's just something of such great peace that comes over you. Um, not exactly, but kind of like the peace of having insurance, you know, that, you know, you know, if, if something happens with your house or car or something, you know, hey, it's going to be insured. It's okay. In the same way, you just know you have this peace in your heart that when you put God first, you have nothing to worry about. So that's the first dimension of being a three-dimensional giver. It's the most important. The wise men gave the gold first. It's mentioned first. They gave it first. It represents royalty. And our first fruit tithe is, God, you're king of my heart, and I'm honoring you this way. The second one is offerings to ministries. 
Offerings to ministries. What does this mean? Well, the second dimension is called an offering, and it's anything that we give above that first fruit tithe, and it's given to a ministry to advance God's mission here on earth. So the difference between the two is this. First fruit is given to God through the church, and it's given just out of my devotion to Jesus being king of my life. A ministry is given above that, and it's out of my passions that I have. Let me give you an example. Um, we all have different passions of how we want to see the gospel advance around the world. Like some people might have a passion for missions. Uh, some people might have a passion for seeing copies of Bibles spread all over the world. Um, some of you might have a passion to, um, to, to, to see human trafficking stopped and some, of, some things like that. Well, we are going to give offerings to where we have passion. Okay, Deb and I have a huge passion for missions. Above our first fruit tithe that we give, we, we are passionate about giving offerings to missions. We love doing that because we want to see the gospel advanced around the world. And so we see that in Scripture in Philippians 4 where Paul was on a mission trip and we see the Philippians church giving him offerings towards his mission trip. It says, as you Philippians know, when I set out for Macedonia or my mission trip, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you. You gave towards my mission trip, he was saying. And verse 19 says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. The third dimension is we have first fruit tithe, Um, given to God through the church out of my devotion. And the second one is offerings to ministries above my first fruit tithe uh, for things I'm passionate for. The third one is this, simply giving aid to human need. Aid to human need. This is just helping people around me, in the community, in my families, wherever I'm at. When I see human need, whether someone's hungry, thirsty, needing clothes, needing something. I want to give financially to help them in their need. We see this in the Good Samaritan story in the Gospels. And and we know that the Bible says, the generous will themselves be blessed. Why? They share their food with the poor, or they help people that are in human need. So when you look at this three-dimension church, Um, It's kind of like in the same way you're probably helping people have a diverse financial portfolio. Being a three-dimensional giver helps you be a a, a a diverse giving portfolio um, where we're we're giving our first fruits to God and we're also giving to ministries that we're passionate for and we're also helping people that are in need. And it's so important. In fact, I want to commend this church for the way Um, that you have been generous just in this past month with helping people in need. Um, First and foremost, the Akron Dream Center food drive. If you notice out in the foyer, it's packed with food that that this church has provided to help people in Akron with the need of hunger. And then there's the 100 blessing boxes that this church uh, generously gave that we could give boxes out to the community that have non-perishable food items and toiletry items to be a blessing during the holidays. And then there was the blessing tree where there were 72 opportunities to bless kids and families in our community this Christmas to make sure they had a great Christmas. And also there were people that gave extra and above that, that we were also able to take those finances and give to the parents this year, something we've never been able to do. And then um, we also gave 50 hygiene bags to the people that we minister to on an annual basis in West Virginia. So church, thank you so much for your past, present, and continued generosity in this way. And as we wrap up today, I just want to encourage us to remember that big idea That big idea is that when we align our financial life, which is a big part of our life, it affects every one of us. When we align our financial life to Scripture, we will, not maybe, but we will experience God's peace, joy, and blessing in our life. So true, Pastor Mark. Um, I I like to look to Proverbs, Proverbs 11, uh, for some, just some passages that help me struggle with... um, between wealth and what the Bible wants of my wealth. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. So 
is a wonderful one. One person gives freely, it gains even more. Yet another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Those who trust in their riches will fail, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Mm. I find myself questioning, you know, am I using my God-given ability to produce wealth the way God wants or the way I want? You know, like Pastor Mark was saying, he's so right. You, the Lord doesn't want you to be poor. He doesn't want us to be in need. We need a certain uh, level of, of savings and earnings. But the Bible consistently points to the folly of wealth. The Bible discounts wealth relative to our happiness. I learned that on the 27th floor. And time after time, it points to what God expects of a Christian and their wealth. If I've developed what could be called a relationship with my money, I definitely need to reflect on what the Bible says that relationship should look like. Mm. And so oftentimes we can, we can make giving so hard and so stressful. And like, I hope we, we conveyed today that, you know, it's the Bible that helps us with this. Yeah. It helps yeah. direct us right. to our own personal path of giving. You know, uh, I remember a message, Pastor Mark, that you gave quite some time ago. I, I think Carol and I had not been here maybe, maybe six months. And um, it was talking about, you know, giving more and then getting more. And Carol and I talked about that a lot, and we discussed it. And we, honestly, we were doubtful. We were hesitant. We had never in our lives really, really meaningfully given. Hmm. And we said, finally, you know, if, if we're going to live by the Bible, if we're going to live by what God's telling us, and like you spoke several weeks ago about, you can't just take the parts of the Bible that, yeah, this is easy. I like this. I like this. Nah, not this. Nah, not this. Right, right, it's, right. It's, 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 a, it's a book that teaches you how to live. And we finally said, okay, we're going to take that leap of faith because it's about faith, right? And so we said, we're going to have faith in God that this is what we should do. And we became meaningful givers. And I have to tell you, in retrospect, um, I don't know when it was, maybe six months ago. I was having some conversations with some people, and, and we were talking, you know, how's the family? How's the grandkids? How's this? How's that? How's work? And I found myself saying, as the standard answer to that, to that question is, I'm busier than I want to be. And I one time caught myself saying that, and I thought, that's kind of a strange thing to be saying. But I just started saying it about, I don't know, nine months to a year ago. And basically what, that was, what I'm saying is that God has given me more clients, more business that have simply walked in the door and say, I need your services. Unsolicited. Absolutely unsolicited. Right. And that to me is, was, was a moment that helped me realize what, what, that, what that really means. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in that vein, I think, Carol and I experienced so much peace and blessing in our giving. And I really wanted to convey this to you today. Um, I urge you, if you're struggling with this, with this aspect of your faith, just start. Yes. Just start. Start somewhere. Just start. start. Yep. And, I, and I think, no, I can't say this, I can't say this professionally when I'm doing investments, but I will tell you, I guarantee you'll find peace and blessing from it. Right. Amen. Amen. I agree. So church, growing in generosity, we give despite the resistance. we got to know that when there's resistance, the enemy's probably be behind that, trying to resist you and stop you because he doesn't want you to do it because of all the good that's in it. He doesn't want that for you. Two, see it as an act of worship. See it as holy. Doing this to just say, God, God, you're king of my life. You, you've got my heart. And three, give three-dimensionally. Give that first fruit to God. God says, you determine what that looks like. And then say, wow, what am I passionate for? What kind of ministries am I passionate for? Let's bless those ministries so we can see the gospel advance. And let's just keep our radar up for people in need all around us. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you that we get to be a part of this church family. Lord, that you are the great shepherd. You are the pastor. You are the leader of this church. And Lord, we're following your lead, Lord. And God, Thank you that you want us to experience your peace and joy when it comes to something that's so stressful. God, help us to have the correct relationship with money. 
Help us to align our financial life to your word. Help us to do it your way, God. And Lord, I just pray that we'll see story after story after story of people saying, wow, I took God at his word. I became more generous. And look what God has done in my life. We just pray that all across this place. And before we close, church, if there's anybody here today or joining online and you can really relate to that first scripture that I shared, generous God, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that we could have eternal life. Maybe you're here today and maybe you just sense that you're far from God or you know, you're not where you want to be and you want to commit your life to the first time or recommit your life to Christ. Man, today is the day. God is just showering his love all over you. He wants to remind you that he gave his son that you could have life and just receive him into your life today. Just by inviting him in to say, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life. You can have the wheel, take control, forgive me. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want to be a Christ follower in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Man, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, man, it's so important that you acknowledge that. There's a connection card in front of you. Make sure you don't leave today by filling that out and letting us uh, uh, see that connection card by turning it into the information center so we can not only celebrate you but resource you and help you along your way. That would be amazing. If you're joining us online, you can fill out a digital uh, con- a connection card. We want to get you a fresh start pack and help you. All right. Amen, church. Well, let's all stand. Thank you so much for being here today. You're in the right place, I can tell you that. Sunday mornings, this is the place to be. And uh, we love you guys so much. Um, Don't forget, we will see you next week. Have a great week. Blessings. I want to ask our prayer teams if you would just please come and be available at this time for anyone that would need prayer. God bless you. Love you. See you.